So about that throw a banana at a bear thing, I'm just kidding. I don't want to read in the newspaper that somebody threw a bear at a banana and got murdered. <laughs> throw a banana at a bear and got <laughs> and got murdered. Don't throw a bear at a banana. That won't do shit. human activity for thousands of years. Discover our rich natural and cultural history. This is a uh, protected archaeological site. Um, apparently a very important one. I'm at Morrow Mountain State Park and there's a uh, little museum here. It's about 94 degrees. It's really hot today. And the, uh, the lizards are seeking shade. There's one right there. Tomorrow Mountain. And I'm, uh, I've been camping somewhere in there. At least 10,000 years ago, American Indians discovered abundant resources in the Owari Mountains. Tracking herds and hunting large game, these early North Carolinians found the local rock known as rhyolite was perfect for crafting tools and spear points. Their way of life changed and small game hunting and fishing led to more sophisticated tool making. Points and spearheads made from Morrow Mountain rhyolite have appeared up and down the east coast, indicating this area was a major contributor to regional American Indian culture. Remnants of this sharp stone remain today at the prehistoric quarry at the top of Morrow Mountain. This is, uh, this is rhyolite here. You can see it's smooth. It's better for making tools than, uh, this would have been. This is coarse. So, you, you know, you want to look for the smooth stuff. Rhyolite was formed hundreds of millions of years ago by a thick magma that cooled and hardened. Once buried as a result of movements in the Earth's crust, it was exposed by erosion over hundreds of millions of years. Some uh, displays here. Let's see what they got. It says, uh, flint napping is the name of the process for making flaked or chipped stone tools. This technology was used to create spear, dart points, arrowheads, knives, scrapers, blades, and other useful items. The best rock for making tool is somewhat brittle and uniform in texture and structure like the rhyolite found on Morrow Mountain. Rhyolite, when struck with a rock, a piece of antler, or bone will fracture or break in a characteristic pattern called a conchoidal fracture. This rock fragment is called a flake. The making of a stone tool begins with a piece of raw material called a core. Flakes are removed by striking the edge of the core with a sharp forceful blow in what is called percussion flaking. Hard hammer stones of basalt or soft hammers made out of an antler were used to create the flakes. 
A stone flake has features that identify it as a work of human hands rather than the result of a natural process. The edges being worked must be ground dull with a piece of sandstone rock prior to flake removal. This is the dulling that helps prevent edge collapse. Soft hammers we used because they allow greater control of the flaking. Soft hammers do not pass as much energy to the core and will absorb some of the force. Not all the time, sometimes it explodes in your hand. The napper applies downward and outward pressure to snap off a flake. This method can straight, straighten and sharpen the edges of a finished tool or shape a tool from flake to final form. So, small edged piece, preform, final arrowhead or spear point. I got more, uh, this is a uh, Paleo Indian era. So, these are the uh, four shafts with the spearheads on them. That black stuff is pine pitch wrapped with uh, probably deer sinew. And the scrapers and side scrapers are mostly used to scrape flesh from hides. Side scrapers we use for a variety of purposes including skinning, scraping, and cutting of meat and skin. They were also used in bone and woodworking. Scrapers were often crude but effective tools. The term paleo means old or ancient. It is used to refer to, refer to the first people that came to this area at least 12,000 years ago. Paleo Indians lived in an environment that was much different than that of today. The weather was cooler and large animals such as mastodons, mammoths, ground sloths, giant bison roamed the forest and grassland, grasslands. Smaller mammals such as buffalo, bear, moose, elk also lived in the area but now are now extinct here. Not too far away at a Cherokee forest, they have, they reintroduced elk. Uh, Paleo Indians used heavy spears to hunt large prey such as mastodon and giant bison. Smaller animals were also hunted. Paleo Indians gathered nuts, berries, and other plants for food. They moved often to take advantage of seasonal sources of food, much like the, their descendants during the archaic period that followed. Relatively little is known about these first people of North Carolina as artifacts from this period are scarce. Their nomadic way of life and small populations made it difficult to find sites they once occupied and to find artifacts associated with them. Hmm. And this is more um, spear points. It's going to be difficult to see. That's a really well polished Celt Celt. It's pretty much an axe. Hmm. 
This would have been an arrow, but an incredibly short one. That would that wouldn't work very well. Whoever made that. Take a little look down the trail here. It's a good place to uh, to come and look and learn and. As you can see, that's all rhyolite. But you're not allowed to pick up or take anything from any state parks. But it's really cool to look at. beautiful place. Just have to look out for rattlesnakes. I like to rest in the sun on trails like this. This is an archaeological site and it is protected. It is against the law to pick up any rock, any mineral, or anything like any of this would be completely unethical to touch any of it because this is what ancient people worked with and it has not all been studied there is more to learn people don't realize that there is more to learn uh, in North Carolina here not much is known about the Paleo-Indian period. And I could guarantee you that if an archeologist came here and did a study, that they would find evidence. I've had people say to me that there's nothing left to be learned by archeologists. And looking at all this, I would have to say I completely disagree with you. And I'm glad this place is protected. People for thousands of years sitting here quarrying this stuff. And it's all over the place. So cool. Walking on history here. So my first night, uh, we got in kind of late, and um, uh, we pulled into a pretty dark campsite. I saw where the tents were set up, and uh, all of a sudden I saw some movement around my driver's side window, and I had all the lights off, so I put the headlights on, and I'm still sitting in the car. We had just gotten there. We were starting to move stuff around to be ready to uh, set up camp. And I just see this dark shadow move past. So I put the lights on. And I put on the brake. And I looked behind me. And I just saw a tail. Fluffy tail go past. So I said to, I said to Leah, who was sitting next to me, 
take a look behind you and let me see what you let me know what you see and I hit on the brake and she lets out a yell and she's like oh my god it's a random poodle in the woods so I thought it was like a coyote or <laughs> something like that but it was some kind of a black lab poodle mix just sniffing around my car and one of the other campers must have let their dog off the leash for a little bit at two or three o'clock in the morning. So after the uh, Mara Mountain trip there, we went back to Owari Forest and I was looking around for some bryolite and chert uh, in the creeks and I didn't really find too much. Uh, I did find a few pieces and uh, made, tried to make some tools out of those. I'm gonna try some more in a probably later today but uh at Awari Forest they had the primitive dispersed roadside camping and uh hiking trails off-road vehicle trails uh they had a, a big lake they had creeks everywhere there was you know people fishing there was people on boats in the lake and uh just in exploring the forest we came to one of the primitive campsites with a fire ring right in the middle and uh, I backed my car in, backed my SUV in and I got out and I realized there were shards of flint sticking out of the ground. So I get out of the SUV and I'm setting up camp and I'm looking around and there's evidence of people making stone tools there. There's flakes, there's little knives, there's little hide scrapers, there's just tools everywhere at this campsite. I pulled in here and right here was a bunch of flakes for cutting and skinning. And here's where we were cooking. And all around there was um, skinning tools. And over here where Leah was sitting, I started to notice some hide scraping tools. So here's the fire pit, and all of these are tools, like here's a knife, that's a knife, there's little, you know, scrapers everywhere, and just look, it's, it goes, it just goes and goes. And we're sitting, literally, sitting on these tools. And I was like, wow, this, you know, why, why does nobody see this? It's, well, anyway, I plan to do some primitive camping. And, uh, you know, look for the chart. So... I figured uh, around this camp would be a good place. I, I was like, okay, down at the creek there might be flint in the creek, and that's why there's tool making material right here. You know, maybe they were making harpoons for hunting. Maybe they were making maybe they were making harpoons for fishing and spears for hunting. So um, I set up the tent, backed the car in, and uh, made some food. Was having a little bit of a problem getting uh, comfortable because of my um, my thyroid issue. Uh, one of them with the medication because I'm hyperthyroid. Uh, I have a heat intolerance. I feel like I can't breathe. So I went from cold of Connecticut. It was like 50 here to. 97 degrees within a few hours. I was having tr having trouble setting up camp. I was having trouble being comfortable. Um, I did have a little portable fan with me just in case that would happen. I, I expected that was going to happen, but I didn't think it was going to be that bad. Um, so once I finally did fall asleep, all of a sudden I hear a ton of, ton of off-road vehicles and they came right into my camp. 
and they put their brights on my tent and they're just yelling oh there's somebody here there's somebody here what the and I was like, what the hell? Yeah, there's somebody here. Don't shine your freaking lights into my tent and start yelling. And they stayed there for about five minutes. And then they drove off, but then they were looping all night long, the rest of the night. The rest of the night, all night long. Three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, the next day I was like, all right, I don't want to be near the off-road trail because that was, I couldn't sleep. So I get up and I start packing up camp. And I get into my SUV, I turn, turn the ignition, and I look, and I see the tire light is on. I get out, and I look, and I have a flat tire. I'm like, what the hell? So we went, to, uh, we went down the road, and there was a gas station with an air pump, and I just filled the tire. And I went to the shop. Drove all the way to the shop. On the drive out of town saw some signs and stuff and some papers that said uh you know bigfoot bigfoot legends of sightings look at look at the tracks and so as we were driving out of the forest there was a guy walking with bigfoot feet and he was just stomping and he's stomping making the impressions <laughs> so i thought that was amusing and it was, uh, you know, just down one of the forest roads. He was just walking with these Bigfoot feet, making trails. Um, I didn't think to video that because I was in the middle of trying to get my tire fixed. And I was like, ah, what am I going to do? I didn't want to get stuck in the woods with no signal and just be on a forest road with uh, off-road vehicles flying down it. So I just wanted to get out of there. We went to uh, Walmart Auto to repair it. Uh, waited around for about an hour and they only charged me 10 bucks to fix it so that was cool only 10 bucks to plug the tire and uh, they told me that something must have stabbed into the tire and popped it because there was nothing stuck in there just stabbed so I was like it was the flint it was the flint at the campsite um, while we were waiting and it was so hot that our shoes were melting to the pavement, to the blacktop in the parking lot. So um, it was just too hot. Like with, with my thyroid issue and all and the heat intolerance, I felt like I couldn't breathe. So I wanted to head up north into the mountains just a little bit. The other thing I really wanted, wanted to do at Uwari Forest was hold a gathering and uh, you know, teach some people how to do flint napping and how to make stone tools, how to make stone weapons, how to make arrows, and just, you know, teach some people, maybe like 10, 20 bucks a person. And uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I could, it was too hot. So I'm looking to do something um, up north more. You know, I got, I got to get this, uh, this thyroid thing figured out. I can't be so high on the medication. I can't be at such a high level of medication because it makes me out of breath. It makes me um, not able to do hard work and not able to tolerate heat at all. Like at all, like I can't breathe. I feel like I gotta go to the hospital. Um, and I guess that's a common thing with, with this condition that I have, uh, hyperthyroidism. Well, it's actually, I had my thyroid taken out. And uh, so technically I'm hypothyroid, but with the medication they give me, it keeps me hyperthyroid, which means high thyroid. And that gives a lot of, um, like a high pulse, uh, out of breath feeling, um, ringing in your ears, nausea, uh, all, kinds of, all, kinds of, all kinds of crazy symptoms. But, um, I'm figuring it out. Um, I've lowered my dose. And, uh, a lot of the symptoms went away. But now I still have the heat intolerance and that I can't seem to figure out. So, I'll talk to the doctor more and I'll see what he has to say about it. But I suspect that I have to be lowered more. And then, uh, you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm doing okay. I'm alright. I'm good.
not 93, it's 173. We're on the way to the Great Smoky Mountains, and there's elk there. Elk with collars. When I was back at uh, Morrow Mountain, it was just too hot. I was trying to walk down the trail and record a little bit, and I got too overheated. I was dumping water in, water on my head and still too overheated. So, uh, kind of just flew through that. I'm a little disappointed that it got so hot so quick in North Carolina. Um, just, I wanted to stay there for a couple weeks at least, and uh, I was there for maybe three days. I'm not used. To, I'm not used to the heat at all. I have a like a heat intolerance from the thyroid stuff. But um, back in the uh, Uwari forest, saw a couple squished rattlesnakes and uh, lots of strange bugs. Um, a couple crazy looking newts, blue ones, crazy colors. I think I got one on. I think I got one on film that I should be able to put into this video. So we're heading towards Pisgah National Forest. It's the middle of nowhere out there and it has uh, primitive campsites where you can just, it's just a fire ring. You pull your car in, there's a fire pit, you set up your tent and take it easy for the night. Um, after that I'm going to head up towards Cherokee and where hopefully I'll be able to see some of the, uh, the elk that they reintroduced. Last time I was there, I saw about maybe like 20 elk, and uh, it was pretty amazing. But I'll see what I can come up with uh, heading northwest up into the mountain where it's a little bit cooler, hopefully. If you aren't used to it, it's bad. It's still 93. I can see the mountains though. I wonder if the elk have gotten into Tennessee yet. I wonder if they've multiplied enough to start to spread out like an elk explosion. <laughs> There's no way to switch this to show the view, huh? Alright, I'll stop and switch the view. It's gonna be cool. I stopped for a minute to look at the, um, the hunting regulations in Tennessee, and it seems that they have elk up there, but no open season on them. You can't hunt them yet. So we're in the uh, like the foothills of the Smokies now. It's about a 10 degree drop in temperature, 2,166 feet in elevation. I'm feeling better. It's uh, definitely more comfortable and maybe I'll be able to do some uh, flint napping demonstrations up here. I don't know yet, I'll see when I get there. There's a giant lizard on top of that roof. So, it's much cooler up here. Much cooler up here. No. I came all the way to the top. So this is what these forest roads where you could camp look like. Sometimes they're a little bumpy. There's a turkey. Yes, uh, a turkey just flew up when that car drove past. I have a feeling it might be a little busy. 
it's uh, Mother's Day weekend, it's Sunday. But we'll see how it looks. So we came up a couple thousand more feet to try to find a good campsite. We found a good one here. This says we can't leave any food exposed because of bears. So you gotta yell, hey bear, a lot, apparently. Hey bear. And I'll show you what these primitive campsites look like. And this one's really good. Um, here's where you set up your tent. And just a little fire pit. Now this one's extra good because we can walk down this trail here. It's pretty far from that camp up there. I mean, it's a bit of a ways. And down at the end of the trail here is another fire pit. So that means we can cook down here. Yeah, this looks good. We could cook down here. There's a really nice view. Another trail going down even further. I haven't looked down there yet. But if you look in the distance, we're pretty high up. I think this will be good for a few days. hearing noises from the front of my car so I got out and the engine splash guard was snapped and hanging off so I tied it back up with some hemp string and I called one place it was called first aid auto and I spoke to it the manager his name was Seth and he told me to come right down and uh, you take a look at it. So I got down there and he gave me the pieces for free. Put it all together. And uh, set me on my way. So now I'm going to enter a tunnel. Uh... <laughs> it's dark. So I'll, um, I'll put in pictures of uh, his uh, auto repair shop and uh, his contact information for anyone that's ever in the area here near Pisca Forest. That's the guy to go see. He's super friendly, helped me out right away. In and out, I wasn't even there for five minutes.
We're heading to the Tennessee border for the hunting license and a spot to camp. Jesus. So we're at uh, an elevation of 4,000 feet right now. And these roads are not as anywhere near as bad as Pisgah. But when we're coming down the hills, well, down the mountain, I should say, the gravel is not very steady. And I feel like I'm slipping a little bit and there's, you're not gonna be able to see it on camera, but to the right is huge cliffs. And it's making me quite a bit nervous to be driving on this road. I'm gonna stay as close as I can to the left as possible. Turn right on North River Road. What? See, if you look at the tire track, somebody came through here before, it looks like they were sliding. It's kind of muddy. Well, that's the Tennessee border. We're pretty high up. So about to cross in now. Hmm. Looks like Tennessee. Sounds like Tennessee. Okay, you ready? As soon as we pass this sign. Aha, Tennessee! Hello, Tennessee. Hey, better watch out, squirrels. Where are the squirrels? Where are you? So it's been about 45 minutes on this road so far, and I think I probably got about 45 minutes more to the campsites. And then it's like an hour past that to town. So this really is middle of nowhere. Sudden change to paved road. So weird. So normally I wouldn't have been concerned about the dirt road, but um, I was on a 4,000 foot cliff there. I was on the side of a mountain and the car was sliding in the mud. This is a lot better. Uh, there's no cliff over here though. I seem to be driving right over top of the mountain now. Um, still at elevation 3,370. So still pretty high up. And I don't know what that sound is. So apparently... My brakes didn't handle that very well. All right. We'll have to see what's up with that now. It's just screeching and grinding. These are brand new brake pads. I had some installed right before I left, so hopefully it's just some sand or gravel stuck in the pad or something. Okay, so I threw some water on the brake pad because I thought maybe there was some sand stuck in there, and it instantly boiled the water. Um, I drove a little bit more, kept up with that grinding, squeak, squealing sound. Just heard a little tiny, tiny bit more just now and then it stopped. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that maybe it was just some grit stuck in the brake pad. But that brake pad was so hot that it boiled the water instantly when I threw it on it.
Okay, it's been about five more minutes and uh, the noise has not come back. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty relieved about that, but I'm not getting my hopes up too soon here. We got about six more miles till the campsite start. Supposedly, hopefully. If not, it's an hour drive from here to town on this road. Up, oh, I'm still hearing some strange noises. All right, we'll see. Ah, uh, we made it to the first one. Okay, I'm pulling in here to check things over. I'll get back. Oh. <laughs> now, just to uh, make things clear here, I'm in a packed SUV with a lot of a lot of weight to it. This is not an uh, off-road vehicle. And there's just um just along this whole road. There's let me disconnect you for a second here. There's campsites right on the water. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's beautiful here. And it's marked as a campsite. Let me pull up to this so you can see. This is campsite number eight, North River. And you can only camp where it has that little tent sign. Yeah, bring this over there. All right, so it's been a uh, it's been a while now, and that sound has not come back. So I think for whatever reason, the spirits are trying to scare the shit out of me. Yeah, different noises, different. <laughs> Sounds like things are flying off my car, and I don't know what the hell's going on. It says, this is the location of the old Haw Knob Baptist Church, where many souls were saved. Pastor Reverend Bud Hamilton, erected by Hob Plemons. And there's, there's not even a, uh, I don't see any foundation or anything. Right across from campsite number seven, North River. Three more miles to go. There is some kind of B on my windshield. Go away, B. So I pulled into the North River checking station. Some activity up there. But this is a cool little stop point. They have some, uh, reading material here. What to do if you encounter a bear. Map. More info. Family campground. There's a fireplace here. And a fan. Cherokee Forest Rules for Forest Visitors. Look at this. Bats of the Southern Appalachians. The big brown bat, the little brown bat, the Indiana bat, the northern bat, the eastern small-footed bat, the tricolored bat, and the eastern red bat. Hmm. A lot of bats. And they have a garden here. 
and a bathroom over there. Really, really cool. We're just trying to outrun the storm. We want some decent weather so that I can uh, hunt in peace and have some nice, relaxing, warm weather. There's a tropical storm coming up, apparently. And uh, hopefully that's being, I, I can't really see the weather, I can't see the news. So I'm just getting bits and pieces, but if it is a tropical storm coming up, hopefully it's being broken Continue up by the mountains. Continue seven miles to north 35.31882 degree W84.13820 degrees on left. Did you get that? Well, that's okay. That Apparently, um, and hopefully, hopefully, the storm is being broken up by the mountains. And we'll see. There's sun over there, but behind us is very, very dark looking stormy weather. So we decided on the uh, campsite across from the uh, old Hoana Baptist Church where many souls were saved. Uh, we drove around for a while looking for something uh, suitable. We got the tent put up. Leah bought a little solar light. So we'll see how that works. And there's water access right there. And Leah is cooking. What you got? Quinoa. Cool. Seems pretty peaceful. You can get my fishing license too. There's trout in there. That. That is Leah. Hi, Leah. Say hi. Hey. That's Leah. Right next to where we set up the little light post is a rock, and on this side is a carving. It says 1962, and then two symbols. Show off your little spice packets. Come on. So bead cases from Michael's turned into spice holders. All the spices. Cayenne? 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 Got cayenne in there? Cayenne. Yeah, okay. So we got 
quinoa, mushrooms, habanero, tomatoes, tomato paste, and all natural, gluten free, no GMO, Melinda's original habanero pepper sauce. Extra hot. What else has it got? Oh, it's also got some sweet pepper in it. Little bits. And green chili. And green chili. It's really good. Check it out. So everything so far in Tennessee has been way cheaper than back home in Connecticut. I have no idea what a value biscuit is. It says it's Tennessee River Smokehouse Value Biscuit Country Ham. One dollar. Value biscuit. Going to try it. I have no idea. I have no idea. It lists sodium nitrate twice and salt. So, yeah, I don't know. wanted to show you guys something. I made this walking stick when I was really sick. And uh, I've been walking with it pretty much everywhere. I bring it everywhere with me. And I've been getting these little tags for it. I forget what they're called. And I don't, I don't have all of them on here yet. But as I go along, I've been collect, collecting them. I made a little modification to it. I just made a four shaft and put it into there. One of the things I like about this is I tie the four shaft around the walking stick pretty much so that this is covered and you're just walking with this pointing down so you're safe. You have a walking stick which is sturdy and good and then if you need this added protection you just pop it in and then you have a spear that has like a seven foot reach and then if you don't need it you just pop it back out and you have a walking stick tie it back on and you're good to go hike If you like these kind of things, I make them. I'm gonna be uh, straight up honest here. This has been hell. I can't sleep. You know, you would think in the middle of the forest it would be peace and quiet. Uh, apparently not in these forests. I'm trying to find a good campsite. And she just wants to sit still, and I do too. But I want to—I want to make sure we're not drowning in mud, or being eaten by a maniac bear, aggressive bear. I really don't want to upload a bunch of videos of bitching about campsites, but I think people should know what they're getting into. You got to be really prepared. This shit is no joke. This is why. 
we keep moving. This does not look good. Guess we'll see, huh? Last night, uh, in Cherokee Forest last night, at that campsite across from the old church, I started to hear the water pick up. I started to hear it move faster. Then, after that, it started to rain real heavy, real fast. So I got up and I told Leah, get up, we gotta go, I don't trust this spot. There's a flash flood warning sign right there. So we packed up as quick as we could. I was completely soaked. Everything in the back is soaked. And uh, which we're on our way out of the forest. And what seems to be the only way out of the forest, a tree falls down and blocks the exit out. So I'm like, okay, I might be able to squeeze the car, squeeze the SUV through this fucking tree that fell down. Then I hear the rushing river off a cliff in the pitch black, and I look up on the hilltop from where the tree fell, and it's just resting in a mudslide. And there's more leaning. So I'm like, okay, maybe I could saw this one fucking branch and drive through. Probably if I would have tried to saw that branch, the tree would have fell on me. So I turned around very carefully because there's mudslides, the road is dirt, it's fucking pouring, and let me try that again. It's freaking pouring, and uh, I had to inch back and forth very carefully. So after turning around at that tree that fell down in the mud, uh, we did manage to find another way out of the forest. It was off a side road and then went to a paved road. Saw quite a few animals on the way out though, that was cool. Saw a, uh, a little tiny owl who's about this big. Um, a fox. Or some kind of Some kind of weasel. Uh, I don't know if it was a long-tailed weasel or if it was a, a mink. I don't know. It was too fast. And um, couldn't find anywhere to go that wasn't destroyed by rain. Uh, it's, all, it's all dirt roads, and I don't have an off-road vehicle. I don't have tires that are suitable for that. 
so then after that I just I just drove in a random chaotic pattern until I could get my head straight because I was actually really pissed that uh, everything I keep trying is not working so I pulled into a Walmart parking lot at 5 a.m. threw all my shit in the back into the front seat fell asleep in the driver's seat for a little bit then I crawled in the back and passed out till about 10 o'clock this morning I woke up and I said screw this area I've tried enough here it's not working I'm a little concerned about all these storms and flash floods so I'm like fuck this I'm driving to Kentucky so I'm gonna go look for Flint in Kentucky something doesn't want me here I'm heading that way I talked to the ranger at the last park and she told me there's flash flood danger and that there's horrible storms coming in be really careful and if you know I know if you hear water speed up and it starts pouring that there is a possibility of a flash flood so where I left apparently there were in the area were flash flash flood like right after I left apparently it seems that I can hunt in Kentucky, but I can't get a clear answer. I, I can't really see on the website. I'm going to stop in and off at an office or something. There's still a lot of thunderstorms in the area. Uh, right now it's sunny. It's 77 degrees. But uh, I'm still going to try. I'm still going to try to. I'm still going to try to do this. Uh, it's just been one thing after another, and. Uh, so I don't know if I mentioned, you know, one of our first camps, we see a bear warning. And I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, bear. Um, so we, you know, we were really careful in cooking, you know, the normal standard be bear aware thing. And uh, I just happened to get signal and I punched in the campsite to see the reviews. And apparently there's a very aggressive bear in the area and nobody camps there. Only at that campsite? Only at that one campsite. And all the other campsites were filled except for the one with the aggressive bear. <laughs> and I was pretty sure I found the bear den. It was right where I was collecting some fallen wood. So the signal popped in after dark and I, we already established camp. We already set everything up. Then I found find out there's a maniac bear on the loose well, and that nobody wants to camp there and it's uh, camp at your own risk danger I'm gonna be uh, straight up honest here this has been hell I can't sleep I can't, I can't rest I can't sleep I have to find uh, you know you would think in the middle of the forest it would be peace and quiet uh, apparently not in these forests in the past in you know other experiences other forests yes it's peace and quiet and it's I don't. And she could back me up. She hasn't slept. I haven't slept. I'm trying to find a good campsite. And she just wants to sit still, and I do too. But I want to. I want to make sure we're not drowning in mud, or being eaten by a maniac bear, aggressive bear, that apparently nobody takes care of. So, um, I really don't want to upload a bunch of videos of bitching about campsites, but I think people should know what they're getting into if they're going into this particular area of the Smoky Mountains. You gotta be really prepared. This shit is no joke. These storms creep up out of nowhere. It, it'll be a sunny day, all of a sudden there'll be rain, one or two raindrops, no clouds, and all of a sudden severe storm out of nowhere <clears throat> um, uh, there's no there's no signal out there it, it's you got to be able to take care of yourself yeah I'd say best advice is if it feels uh, unsafe it probably is um, 
um, I had a feeling that when, when I heard that water pick up that there were going to be trees down on the road and that there was going to be mudslides and all that, and there was. Yep. So trust your instinct. If it doesn't feel safe, leave. You just have to be prepared for anything in those forests. Like there are a lot of wild animals and, and one of the things about the Smokies is it's a lot of animals clustered together in one spot. One of the problems they have is that the bears go after your food. And that's where, uh, you know, any kind of bad uh, interaction or meet up with a bear can happen. Now, um, you know, it says, I was reading some of the pamphlets on what to do if if the bear is uh, aggressive or uh, comes too close to you and it's like raise your arms and make noise or <laughs> it says do not play dead this will not work um, the other thing it said was don't toss it food this will create future problems I'm pretty sure if you're being mauled by a bear and you have some food, you're going to toss it to save yourself and you're not going to be concerned about causing future problems. That just sounds freaking stupid to me. Uh, yeah, if you're being mauled by a bear, do anything you can to survive. Duh. Then another pam pamphlet says, uh, if the bear attacks you, try your best to fight back. That's funny. Um, yeah, like, if, if you're hunting, that's a different story. Like you, you just shoot it. Um, if you're camping and you have a little pocket knife and a bear attacks you, you're screwed. They're like 300 pounds and mostly muscle with giant razor claws. So picture Mike Tyson punching you in the face with claws. That's what I picture. Um, while I was there, I saw no bears. Uh, I saw bear dens. I saw... Uh, some pretty cool caves that bears are probably in. So we're just driving up River Road heading into Tennessee. And I know there are bears around here. So I'm not going to go in there. But there's a big cave. Right there. Yeah, I've learned my lesson about sticking my head in caves in the middle of nowhere with no signal. I don't know enough about bears. I'm not an expert on bears. But I'm pretty sure that if a bear attacked me and I had a banana in my hand, I would throw the banana. It's not fun. And, you know, like if you report the problem that you were attacked with a bear, don't they usually kill the bear? They have like tracking necklaces and shit, and so they know which bear attacked you. You're like that bastard bear. <laughs> that asshole again. <laughs> Welcome to Kentucky. Kentucky. Just entering it now. I don't think I've ever been to Kentucky. I've been driving for like two weeks. So wait, I have been driving for two weeks because I can't find anywhere to sit. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna flip the camera around for a while and be looking something else besides me. So you see these road cuts? Sometimes in these you could find flint. Keep right on Bond Hollow Road. I don't see any flint in those, but supposedly there's flint nearby. I'm gonna be looking for it. I'm hopeful that I'll find some. Hopefully. <clears throat> this time. Okay. 
So about that throw a banana at a bear thing, I'm just kidding. I don't want to read in the newspaper that somebody threw a bear at a banana and got murdered. <laughs> throw a banana at a bear and got <laughs> and got murdered. Don't throw a bear at a banana. That won't do shit. Okay, so I'm in a better mood in Kentucky. Yeah, I'm just joking about the bear thing. Do not take any of that as advice. Okay. Little mountain town here. Daniel Boone National Forest. I'm gonna check out all the campsites scattered through there on uh, freecampsites.net is where I'm getting some of these locations from. It's a great resource. Make sure you read the reviews before you go there. Yeah. Make sure you read the reviews before you go there. You hear him calling? Did you hear him calling? GPS, GPS took me on an OHV road that apparently I needed a helmet for. The GPS took me down that. So, yeah, be careful of that. Didn't get the tent up in time. Here in Kentucky too. Luckily this time I'm up on a, a hill instead of down in a creek valley.
guess I'm gonna sit in the car for a while. <laughs> Seems like it's uh, easing up a little bit. It looks like it's all around me. I'm looking at the, uh, I do have signal here. I'm looking at the radar there. And it's all around me. So, I saw like six squirrels go running for cover. <laughs> so, I just wanted to uh, test this rhyolite point that I made. Cut right through the sinew. But uh, I just wanted to test how strong it was. Seems pretty strong. How the hell am I going to get that out of there? I fired it um, from a 70 pound bow at about 5 yards. Maybe I'll give it one more shot. So I tried regrinding re the edges here to make them uh, a little more dull so they don't cut through the sinew. I'm going to put it right back in now. Alright, so I'm going to test the strength of this stone. It's rhyolite from North Carolina. And I'm just, it, it's not dried completely yet, but I'm just testing the strength. So I'm going to hit right into that tree. Just want to see if the stone itself holds together. Alright, let's see how it did. That's in there. So this is the kind of stuff I like to work. If this was obsidian, this would be in a thousand pieces. There's not even damage. Alright, so what happened here was it didn't I didn't let it dry all the way. So it just kind of slipped out. But if I'd let this dry all the way, it would have stayed in. It didn't didn't damage the arrow at all. And I've fired this twice now into a tree. But it's still perfect. Three miles, then turn left on Highway 89. I'm not listening to you anymore. shirt and these road cuts it says there should be some in the area I'm not seeing any yet but I'm gonna check the creeks running through the area as well we'll see so I did read a uh, report one man's report of there being chert just south of a town about an hour an hour or two near Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, seems like there's nothing. This is part of what I do to look for flint. I just look for little hints and explore the area. And unfortunately here, I don't see anything. So part of what I do is I find these, you know, little hints of where chert might be in creeks, rivers, uh, road cuts, and areas where I won't disturb anything important. 
Uh, anything that washes out into creeks is already disturbed, so that's cool. That's cool to take. Um, you just have it, it takes a lot of work to be able to find where these washouts are or where it would be running through a road cut and maybe falling off into the road. Uh, and you just got to be careful. You got to make sure you know the laws. Like some laws say you can't pick up rocks. Uh, but it's, um, it's a lot of detective work. It's a lot of trying to figure out where things might be, where they are. Uh, it's more difficult than you think. On to the next one. So I was hoping to find some uh, new sources of chert, but so far I haven't found much of anything. Uh, I found a little bit of limestone, which I can work. You can work limestone. Um, it's not as fun. It's a little more difficult and it's not as sharp, but it, but it is pretty sturdy. Um, if I don't find anything new this time, I'm going to go back to uh, a place that I have found some really good chert. So that's where I'll probably be heading if I don't find anything. But uh, hopefully, 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 I find something uh, about an hour that way. So if you're ever in Kentucky looking for flint and road cuts and creeks, uh, be really careful. There's people um, let their dogs run in the street. And I've almost hit quite a few because they just bolt out. Like, I don't expect them to just bolt out like that. But there's just, like, free-running dogs, like, pretty much everywhere in these little towns. And they chase the car. Barking. And they chase the car barking. So, like, you got to be careful that they don't get under your back tire. But that's happened uh, three or four times so far. And just now I saw um, dogs following people on horses going into the woods. But they were in the street, and there was just this line of dogs. It was interesting. It's a little chalky. Limestone. I don't know. Looks like shale limestone. It's weird. So we're getting a little bit closer, and in these road cuts, I see a little bit of limestone. But I don't see any chert yet. It's more like a uh, siltstone, shale, a little bit of limestone. And I'm not sure what that is. It's cool looking though. Anybody who's a geologist want to be friends? You can talk to me about rocks all day long. I'll never get bored. See, so that boat ramp there would have been a good place to look, but I'm not going to stop because I don't see any... I don't see anything that looks quite like chert up in these road cuts. But you see the road cut, and then you see the boat launch. Go look down in that creek, because you never know. I might have just seen a patch of flint. Hmm. Maybe I'll turn around. I don't know yet. Yeah, when you see the patches of flint, it'll be like, uh, usually, it'll be like the darker color than the blue surrounding it, or the light gray surrounding it, and it should be shinier. And I'm seeing what looks like little, little, tiny patches, but nothing worth stopping for just yet. seems dangerous. So the main spot was no good. Uh, totally overgrown. I can't really get up there. Um, but I am seeing some very, very old what looks like chert. Oh, 
Um, nothing I would consider good. It's more shell-like than anything. If you look right here, there's, well, yeah, it's, it's shell-like. I mean, that's nothing I would take. All right. Maybe on the other side it's more pure. I don't know, I can't get up there right now. Oh well. All right, so to explain that a little bit better, uh, it looked like it was at one time good chert. Uh, over time when it gets weathered, it turns more shale-like and it starts to fall apart like I showed you. Um, maybe on the other side at the top, there might be some really good stuff, but um, there's no way up there right now. Maybe during the winter I would be able to climb up there, but right now it doesn't look too good. I went down to the, uh, the riverfront to see if there was any rocks on the shore, but it was a very, very deep river and I didn't see any rocks at all, so uh, I guess we'll just continue on. And I'm not really seeing anything, so that report may have been false. Uh, I'll check back again in winter and maybe get up top and see if there's anything at all, but it does not look like it. So one of the things I've been thinking about in looking for chert like this and reading geology reports and them saying, yes, there is high quality chert up here and me going and looking and seeing that it's uh, very, very old, very weathered and not good for flint napping at all. What I'm reading is coming from a geologist's perspective, and um, they aren't really looking at it from a flint napping point of view. Whereas when I'm going to look, I'm looking for the shiny, glassy chert. Or something that fractures in a conchoidal way. Yeah, outwards like, like that. Um, and in some of this stuff, I look at it, and it is chert, or it was chert. Uh, in my, you know, in my not geology opinion, not a geologist opinion, uh, at one time it was chert. That's the way I think of it. Like, it, at one time it was nappable. Uh, now it's just falls apart into dust if you drop it on the ground like you saw in my video. And that's the problem I keep having. Fallen rock zone. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe there's some fallen rock that is flint. I doubt it. But maybe. One of the things that I um, really enjoy about this is I love exploring new places and I love um, just adventuring. So I just got to see all those really cool cut throughs. There's more coming. And uh, I'm just in Kentucky. I've never been here before. And I'm just driving straight through to try to see if I could find anything. I'm also getting to see um, historic sites and they seem to have a lot of markers around. I might have just saw some, so I made a U-turn. I'm not sure, maybe. Um, this is a pretty steep hill. I think I saw a spot to pull off, so if there is a spot to pull off, I'll go look. All right, so I drove around a little bit more and I found it. Uh, problem being, it's about 90 feet up in the air, you need some mountain climbing gear, and it's about that big. It's pieces in a line about that thick. So, that's, uh, that's a bust. That... That was pink. It was pink. Um, I've not seen much pink flint, pink chert. Uh, that was pretty cool. But it's, it was grainy, and like, there's, there's like, like I was saying, the geologists don't know, like, when we're asking for chert, uh, it's got to be solid, glassy, it can't be freeze damaged, it can't be crumbling into dust, uh, but yes, that was chert. Um, I wasn't able to get any video of it, because like I said, you need, uh, some mountain scaling gear, ropes, and claws and grappling hooks and stuff like that, which, you know, I'm not going to do just to look at something this small. Um, if I see any more, I'll probably do it. If I, yeah, oh, if there's I, some. 
Yeah, it's right it up is. there. <laughs> it looks like little bricks. Yeah. Like little bricks going along the side of the uh, the highway. But it's it's not what I would consider uh, a flint knapper's shirt. There's a, a rest area coming up. Let's stop and see if there's another rock face there. Yeah, it says there's a rest area coming up in about a mile. I'll stop there and see if there's any more rock faces that maybe I can record to show you guys what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, there it is again. So there is a vein going this way. I have a friend in Ireland who's trying very hard to find Flint and he's having a rough time. So I figured while I was out, I would show how I go about doing this at least. And then, you know, once you do find that flint in the walls, uh, look in the creeks nearby. But in this case, you're gonna find pieces this big that you really can't do too much with. So, hit and miss. All right, so the speed limit is 70 here, and uh, I can't really get the camera focused on the chirp going past it 70 miles per hour. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna splice in a picture of uh, what the geologist had posted in his report. There is a picture of it. I don't seem to see any more, so we might be past the area that that was in. But it was only about this thick and kind of looked like brick, like just brick in the geological layer. So uh, Eastern Kentucky was kind of a spur of the moment idea, let me try to find some church in Kentucky because that would be awesome. Uh, there were a couple areas, most of them I couldn't get to, some areas were flooded out with the recent storm, and uh, other areas I just, it's private property, off limits. A lot of the rivers were uh, really high, so I couldn't see any rock at all in the rivers. Same thing with the creeks, they were flowing fast and very uh, muddy, so you couldn't see any of the lithic material in the water. Um, maybe another time when I come through, uh, it might be easier to find stuff here. I know there's stuff here, um, but I'm gonna head into Ohio where I know exactly where to get some chert. And that I'll show you. All right, so we're going to a campsite on the Ohio River in Ohio, and uh, hopefully it's good. So I'm just gonna drive and be on the lookout for anything interesting at all, not just Flint. Um, and if I see anything interesting, I'll record it and tell you about it. And Maybe a dead deer, maybe a wild pig, maybe a rampaging elephant, maybe a kangaroo. I saw a kangaroo on an island once, I'm not kidding, in Rhode Island, off the coast, in a little island called Block Island, there was a kangaroo and a camel. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Look it up. Look it up. Nope. Nope. Shale. Nope. 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 We are crossing the Ohio River, and up ahead is the Kentucky-Ohio border. So out of Kentucky and Ohio. And a quarter mile, slight left onto US 52 West. And a slight left onto 52 West. So we stopped to uh, just cook up some potatoes. And I look over here. And that's Flint. I just randomly found Flint. Uh, fire pit in Ohio. The hell? Is it good? Yeah. I'm not sure what kind of flint this is. Might be like basalt, I don't know. 
I don't know of anything that's black like this around here, but I'm going to test it. Ooh. That's flint. Do one more. Yeah. That looks nice. That's good flint. Huh. So, this is what good flint looks like. There's no worked edges or anything, so this is not an artifact. This piece right here you could easily turn into an arrowhead. I have no idea what kind of flint this is. I have to look into it. So the value biscuit is like super salty, super thick bacon. I'm not eating that. Sodium nitrate, sodium nitrate, and salt. No. For more than 10,000 years, Flint Ridge was one of the most important flint quarries in eastern North America. So I came north into Ohio because I know of a spot here called uh, Nether's Farm that has uh, flint. It's uh, Flint Ridge. It's a modern quarry, so you could go there, you could collect flint. Um, I decided I wanted to visit the ancient quarry, which is in Flint Ridge State Park. Where you, you can't touch anything there, don't touch anything there. I'm going to go check out the ancient quarries, and I'm about two minutes away. And then I'm going to head over to uh, Nether's Farm to collect myself some Flint Ridge. So I've never been to the ancient quarry before. Uh, I don't even know which way it is. But there's a sign here. For more than 10,000 years, Flint Ridge was one of the most important flint quarries in eastern North America. The flint formed at the bottom of a shallow ocean 300 million years ago. The softer rocks surrounding the flint have washed away, leaving the hard flint exposed near the surface. Prehistoric people came here to quarry the flint, which they crafted into a variety of stone tools. Hundreds of quarry pits and workshops are scattered for miles along this ridge. Well, it looks like there's a trail over there to the museum. I'll check that out first. It's a little chipmunk in the path down to the quarry trails. There's another one right there. There's a third one. So here is what the flint looks like. This is right below the sign here. Flint is both hard and brittle and thus can be broken into pieces that have razor sharp edges. For this reason, Indians as long as 9,000 years ago traveled to this ridge to secure the rock for making projectile points, knives, and scrapers. The area is now covered with hundreds of shallow pits from which flint has been quarried through the ages. The prehistoric Indians broke off chunks of flint with stone moles or pried them out of the pit with wooden poles. They broke the chunks into usable pieces with hammer stones, as shown here, and then proceeded to chip the flint for various purposes. So along here, all these dips are quarry pits. We'll keep looking around. There's a little bit of flint right here. Probably from in there. Really cool. So we came up this trail here to this hill. And right here is, um, 
some different kinds of flint, different colors. And here is where the quarry pit is, where all these leaves are. You can't really see. Maybe if I put it down to the ground, you could see that it dips. You could tell this is not just a random dip in the woods here. That's dug out. And it's pretty big. It's it's hard to tell on film how big that is. Here's one. There's one over there. Here is probably another one. This one's filled with muck. Anybody watching my videos, you should never disturb an archaeological site. You should find other ways of getting flint, like I'm going to uh, a modern quarry, not too far from here, called Nether's Farm. And I could very easily get flint there. Whenever you see stuff like this, do not touch it. Just look at it and learn from it and appreciate it. It's everywhere. You can see all the little chips. Little tiny chips of flint. Very, very cool. There's all these deep dug out areas. They're, they're right next to each other. There's one here, then it goes up and goes into a ramp and into an even deeper one. I don't see any flint chips here. I mean, there's a few down here. A few little chunks. Must have taken a long time to dig that out like that. It's kind of just like they were digging, like a swimming pool. So this is one of the bigger ones I've seen here. And just like modern quarries, it, you know, they fill with water. This one is filled. So now it's pond. Looks like there's more way off that way, but there's no trail over there. How did they know it was here, like, walking through here? If I was just walking through, I wouldn't know that there was flint under the ground, like right under the ground. And like, are we near a major water source or an even bigger hill? I just don't, I don't understand how they found this stuff in the ground. I could understand finding it in rivers, but then how do you figure out where it is in the ground? The stuff here is so old. The stuff just laying here. If you look, on one side you can see it's rotting. The rock itself, this at one time was shiny and glossy, and now it's turning brittle and rotting away. There's more right here. It's just rotting into nothing. But it's so, so old. Thousands of years old. So what do you think of this place? It's old. <laughs> more pits ahead of us. Yep. Getting bit. Mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> There's another pet. Oh, I can't really see it too well. What yeah, it's really hard to pick up pets. Maybe I'll just stand by it. Yeah, they're big. So there's a few chips here. 
but still have the, the real, real shine to it. Glossy, glass-like. Now these are artifacts, so you don't touch these. But I just wanted to show you, like, you could see through that. And in comparison to something older and rotting, this is what it looks like now. So right here is, uh, looks like fresher stuff. It's way more colorful. This piece here, you'd see the pinks and the white. It's brown and white. And it's all scattered through here. So I guess to answer my earlier question, of how did they find it up here? Just walking down the trail here. And I see this shine. If you dug this out, this would be a massive boulder. But you crack that open inside and it'll be nice and smooth. It's another big outcrop right here. This is all just amazing to me. This is just washing out. And each one of these was made by a person. Like, you cannot make these without knocking them off with another rock. You have to be... In order to make these flakes, every single one was made by a person. That was really cool to see. There was a lot coming out, um, just washing down the hill. And uh, from what I've read, it's the same rock formation that's over at Nether's Farm. So um, I'm gonna head over to Nether's Farm and I'm gonna collect some flint. So we're coming up on Nether's Farm. I know of a spot here called uh, Nether's Farm that has uh, flint. It's uh, flint rich. It's a modern quarry, so you could go there, you could collect flint, and it's a uh, five dollar collecting fee plus fifty cents per pound. She has a little uh, scale set out, a uh, little cat that's out there usually, and you put it in an envelope, write your name and just slide it under her door. Bring buckets. Stuff's good. So we're coming up on Nether's farm. And the pull-off to the quarry is on the left. Careful <laughs> driving on the flint. I already popped my tire once this trip. Um, I believe it was right Your here. destination is on the right. So here's the pull-off for the quarry pits. So I guess that was some flint ridge that I found up the camp. Oh yeah, looks the same. Cool. I'll take this piece. And there's some uh, crazier coders here.
Let the fun begin. Yeah. There's a big chunk of the black over here. So you can get a video of this. This is a quarry pit. So here's a modern quarry pit. I can see the big, the big rock is right down in there. Now this outer stuff, see this, let's see if I can show you. See it's black inside. Am I still bleeding? I have to get your lip. Mm -hmm. A little bit. See the piece I'm after. I don't know if I'm gonna get it. So I've already knocked away this whole chunk here, and that's in my bucket. And I'm going after this piece here. It looks like a nice blue black. And I don't know if I'll be able to get it. So there's a lot of crystally stuff down here, but this is the piece I want. One of the cool things about the flint here is it's got some pieces have these little druzy crystals. And as you can see right there, that thing. Let's see if I can get it to sparkle for you. There you go. And just make it out. Now if you take this and polish it in like a rock tumbler or whatnot. It'll make some really, really beautiful polished stone. All kinds of color bands going through it. Alright. Now that I'm bleeding everywhere, you could see the little crystal pockets that the rock is actually not too good for flint napping. Um, I'm sure I could get something out of it, but I'd rather bring home the best rock I could find here. So I'm going to move on down to the next quarry pit and wipe all this blood off of me. Ow. Flint is sharp. So here at Nether's Farm, the flint is all different kinds of color. The ones I'm grabbing is mostly black. I like to work darker material. But if you look along the trail here, and even up at the other quarry pit there, some of it's clear, some of it's pink, some of it's red, some of it's zebra striped. It's all different kinds of all different kinds of colors. I grabbed some of the zebra striped stuff. You could see the similarities in the pit location from where we were at the um, ancient quarries. You could see how 
modern people with modern tools did the same thing ancient people with ancient tools did. Except they probably did it better. You can see it's so similar to those swimming pool pits I was talking about. It's just straight down. And I read that this particular flint vein is uh, 10 to 12 feet deep. So it goes down deeper. I'm going to try to find different colors and get a good variety this time. So I'll be uh, poking around in here. So, some of the giant boulders that were here in these pits when I was here last year are completely gone. So somebody, you can see there was one right there, it's just rubble now. Somebody came in and tried their best to get slabs. Like this. This is what people are after. This one was thrown away, and I could see why it was thrown away. Because of this crack running through. And this one running this way. So the, probably the only part of this you could use is right here. That's why. Crystals? Although I'm sure Leo will want this. Hold on, hold it still. Oh, it is all crystal. Cool. Oh, you can see inside. Uh huh. <gasps> awesome. I'm going to knock some of it away so you could keep it. Okay. So over time, flint stops looking like flint. Um, even this one, you could see it's a dull, not as shiny black as, say, this. And then as it gets older and older, starts to change and it starts to get freeze damaged from the cold and what happens when you have that is inside becomes all damaged and you can't use it this will not make a good tool so that's why a lot of people have tossed this stuff and that's why ancient people toss this stuff because the top layer has freeze damage on it. 
if you look over here, fresh rock deeper down. So if I knock this piece off, it's going to be really fresh and really glossy. But if I take from up there, it's going to be really dull and not so good. I'll give you an example of right here. I'll see if I can knock a piece off. Just going to try to take a small piece off for you to see. I don't want to ruin this outcrop. Here's freeze damage at the top of it. Okay. I'll give you a little zoom in. I just knocked some of the black off. And in here is freeze damage. Or they call it a seam or a crack or whatever you want to call it. Most places that you can get flint is not like this. This is an insane amount of good flint, good chert. Uh, the landowner is kind enough to let flint nappers come on her property and quarry this themselves and just dig these pits. This was somebody's throwaway because of the crystal pocket that went straight through. But I'll still be able to use this, so I'm going to keep this one. I just took this flake off. You can keep looking around. That uh, there was another one, wasn't there? They filled it in. Oh, they did? And they dug one next to it. Huh. So this is the gray stuff. Gray blocky stuff. I think it would be cool to find a good piece of this to work into something. The problem with this stuff is uh, it's blocky. You can see there's blocks. Instead of a smooth transition, it chunks off. There's a good example. And somebody lost their belt. Are they trying to haul the whole rock out for the belt? That's freeze damaged. That's weathered. 
you could see how crystalline and grainy that is compared to the smooth the smoothness of some of this stuff. Let's give it a try anyway. Yeah, that's no good. Make sparks. So this is the pit here. The rock is gone. But it looked like this, and uh, some people from the Wooded Beardsman's channel might recognize this material from his Easter egg knife giveaway. But there's, uh, there's not much left of this rock. So when the rock is gone, the rock is gone. That's it. It's nothing big enough for a knife of that size out of that material again. So a freeze damage? Yeah. Blocky? Yeah. The big, the big block of it was right there. It's gone. Remember I just took the hammer, the hammer stone actually, and I hit the top and the big blade came off? Yep. That was the knife. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. So. Looks like the only pit with uh, new rock in it is the one right at the entrance. Alright, I'm just going to keep testing rock and hitting on it until I find something smooth, not like this one. And I'll let you see what we, uh, what we finish up with when we're on our way out of here. I didn't get all too much and it got kind of late. But what I did get was pretty good. I'm just gonna bring it up to her. bring it up to her porch and she has a scale up there and I'll just sign my name and pass the money under the door. I'm gonna come back uh, probably in a day or two and quarry some more. So I came to Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, and um, it said it's only open Saturday and Sunday, but um, they just happened to be doing one tour today, so I'm able to get in, and uh, I'm kind of excited. I wanted, I've been wanting to come here. And they kind of told us to avoid the uh, school groups, so I'm trying to. Uh, they're down in the Indian village area over there right now. And uh, I'm heading up towards... Said 1770s cabin. 1770s cabin. Um, just killing time for about an hour. Maybe about 40 minutes now and then uh, we're going over to the rock shelter. So I don't know if I'm going to be uh, allowed to record in the rock shelter itself, but the grounds here are pretty cool. They got a little uh, atlatl spear throwing event 
with little kids throwing the spear at elk. Um, an elk decoy. Yeah, an elk decoy. Um, they also have like showing off furs to the kids and uh, a couple little wigwams. But uh, I didn't really see too much over that way because there was so much going on with the kids and they kind of told me to avoid the school groups. So I uh, came over to here in this little picnic area with a cool oven over there. And we're just hanging out. Okay. I also have um, the farm implement museum with old wagons. I, was mm. gonna... I don't know what that sound means. What am I supposed to do? Is it lunchtime? It sounds like lunchtime. I hear the kids screaming. So I'm assuming during the busy season that they have a lot more actors walking around and uh, playing parts of like farmers or blacksmiths or I don't know that's what I'm assuming it show I saw some pictures of people dressed in you know early colonial but um it's not open it's not open today I just happened to get lucky and be able to uh, get in on one tour of the rock shelter. So we're about to go into the rock shelter. I don't know if I'll be able to record in here. So I'll record a little bit on the outside. But right up there is the entrance into the rock shelter. Hey there. Hurry. Hurry. I said take your time, no big hurry. I'm here. And the creek is down here. It's a beautiful structure, isn't it? A local architect from Pittsburgh built it. For the other ones to come up, and then we'll start. Interesting. It's a little archaeology bags there. So I guess they're not ex excavating anymore. There's a screen up there. <laughs> So I'm at Cross Creek Lake. This is the Lake Shore Trail. There's Leah. Hey. We just left Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. And uh, that was a little weird coincidence. Um, we just happened to get there and it was closed. But there was school groups going through um, that were in there. And uh, there was one other couple that had a tour today. And I got there just in time that they, uh, they allowed me in. I did get a little bit of video. And uh, the tour guide, and her name was uh, Sheila, was really amazing. Uh, she's been working there for 35 years. And she knew a lot of information. And I talked to her a little bit about uh, 
different things uh, about the site, about uh, the museum that I volunteered at. And she wanted me to get in touch with the director to see if I could possibly do some flint napping demonstrations at the rock shelter, which would be really cool. Walking down this trail along Cross Creek Lake. Now, Cross Creek runs right past Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, so we just followed it down to this park. Meadowcroft Rock Shelter is a cave, kind of. It's an overhang that collapsed over the years. And in that cave is different levels of different time periods of people living there that go back as far as, what was the date, 12,500? Yeah, they dug as deep as 16,000. They dug as deep as 16,000 years ago. And the earliest human occupation that they found was 12,500, I believe. All the way up to present evidence of All the way up to use. beer cans in a fire pit. Yep. I wasn't expecting to um, be able to see that. I tried last year and it was closed and they wouldn't let me in. Um, this year, for whatever reason, they're like, yeah, come right in. And they were all awesome. Awesome people, friendly people. It's the longest spanning occupation of a site. So meaning from 12,500 years ago, nonstop up to today, with the exception of now it's a museum. So there aren't people camping there anymore. But up to not too long ago, there's been people camping there for 12,500 years at least, which is pretty amazing. In one spot, one, cam in one campsite. It's the longest spanning occupation of a site so meaning from 12,500 years ago, nonstop up to today, with the exception of now it's a museum. So there aren't people camping there anymore. But up to not too long ago, there's been people camping there for 12,500 years at least, which is pretty amazing. In one spot, one cam in one campsite, but it's a, I'll, I tried to take video to show you the amazing view of the creek and how much, how big the shelter actually was and just how cozy it seemed in there. Yeah. Oh um, man, it was like 10 degrees cooler. It's pretty hot out today. Yeah, so I would have really camped nice. in there. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and I would have nice... camped in there and I would have stayed there for like a week. <laughs> yeah, a nice view of the creek. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that site was discovered by a groundhog. <laughs> um, apparently in the hole that it dug up, the person who, I guess he owned the land? Yep. The person who owned the land, there's some large deer prints right there. Right here. So, um, the landowner found a groundhog hole, and in the dirt from the hole that it pulled out was chips of flint. So, long story short, it took him 18 years to find an archaeologist that would dig out the site that he, well, that a groundhog discovered for him. So he didn't want to tell anybody about this site because he was afraid people would come in. I'm sliding down this hill and uh, loot it and destroy, as he said, uh, pages of history and not be able to get them back. So he didn't tell anybody 
about this site for 18 years until he found an archaeologist who, was, who would be willing to come and do it correctly. I just thought it was really, uh, really amazing. So this is pretty cool. There's a big lake here. And there's a creek running into the lake. Okay, so the other thing that I uh, learned from this place was that there was a uh, occupation before Clovis. So it was called, they, the point that they found was only about this big. And I saw that it had hit something and fractured and they resharpened to fix it. Um, that point was 12,500 years old, which would be the oldest point on the East Coast here. And that was, uh, it was at a very bottom layer of this cave. Now they named the point after the guy who discovered the site from investigating the groundhog hole. Miller. Uh, his name was Miller. They, they were selling t-shirts that said, My Miller point is older than your Clovis point. Which I was like, yes.